Hello. Welcome to the Bore You to Sleep podcast. The podcast that will hopefully help you get to sleep. I am going to read an open source book, one that is not particularly interesting, but one that is hopefully boring enough to get you to sleep. Tonight's reading comes from Handbook on Cheese Making, written by Gio E. Newell and published by the Michigan Dairyman. This book looks at the manufacture of cheese during the 1800s. It's more about the process and the equipment involved, so rest assured, it should not make you hungry. My name is Teddy, and I am to help people everywhere get a good night's rest. Sleep is so important, and my mission is to help you get the rest that you need. The podcast is designed to play in the background while you slowly fall asleep. Thank you to everyone who shared their words of gratitude with me during the week. Firstly, a huge thank you to the new patrons that are supporting the show on Patreon. Alice Rhodes, Enid Sorkowitz, Steve Layden. Your monthly support with a financial contribution is truly appreciated and allows me to bring out more episodes for those who need them. Thank you, as always, to all Spotify listeners for continuing to respond to the Q&A. For everybody who listens on Audible, Dennis Lennox, thank you for your review, playing episodes at a slower speed with lower volume sounds like a great idea. S. Percival Simmons, thank you for your kind review on Audible, and I'm glad you keep returning to Boy to Sleep iTunes listeners from the US, Michael from Virginia, aka Hands Off DJ, thanks for not being able to complete an episode. From the UAE, it is Joe Mama. I'm glad you're already bored by the introduction. DB Pogue, thank you for never making it to the end of a story. And finally, Thank you to everyone who wrote in through the website. Tharana, thank you for being a long-time listener of the show. I hope all is well in Thailand. Leo, thank you for some of your suggestions for topics such as science and nature. Anna from Portugal, what an amazing message to receive from you. I'm so glad the podcast has helped in such a profound way, and thank you also for your suggestions. And finally, Riley, to have this podcast support you while in a military environment and surroundings is an amazing compliment. And as always, thank you to all existing patrons and sponsors as well as everyone who took the time to send a message or leave a review during the week. My goal is to keep this podcast free to allow access for everybody. If you find the podcast beneficial, one small way to help is to share the podcast with a friend and leave a review in your podcast app. Even one sentence helps out. If you would like to become a sponsor or patron, please visit boytosleep.com, where you can support the podcast. Whether it's $1 or $5, every bit of your contribution allows me to bring out more episodes for those who need them. You can always say hello at boytosleep.com or Instagram at boytosleep.com. In the meantime, lie back, relax, and enjoy the readings. Handbook on Cheese Making by Geo E. Newell Published by the Michigan Dairyman, Grand Rapids Preface 
This little work on cheese manufacture is inscribed to makers, dealers and consumers in the hope that its careful perusal may be of aid to one and all. The prestige that American cheese holds in the markets of the world has been threatened from many quarters, but we who inaugurated the cheddar system on this side of the Atlantic are not prepared to succumb to competition, however sharp, or to prejudice, however strong. American cheese will hold its own as long as it has a square quality basis to stand upon. We possess the most natural and privileged dairy regions on earth. Let us utilize to their fullest extent the greatest advantages within our grasp. Dairymen have of late been struck with consternation by the ascendancy of Canadian cheese over the state's product. The dairy press have been pounding away at the gruesome situation so vigorously that many cheese men have been frightened into the belief that Canada has a corner on gilt-edged quality and fancy quotations that is liable to continue indefinitely. The writer has no such apprehension, however, and sees no reason why an American cheese should not always be a peer of the best. There has been unanimous action all over the dairy portions of the Dominion to the effect, the slight advantage they now hold. If in a strenuous endeavour to improve the product, our friends across the border have succeeded and at the same time have stimulated us to a like movement, then thanks be to them. Legitimate competition aids all mankind. As the caption indicates, this treatise is from the pen of a practical maker who analyzes cheese manufacture from a standpoint of practice and experience, and not theory. In elucidating to my readers the fundamental and collateral fabric of milk manufacture, I write from the desk of a cheese factory with milk, utensils, and product, under my immediate and daily supervision. In these pages, I shall discard everything theoretic and base the whole value of the book on its practicability. In doing so, my constant thought shall be the elevation and supremacy of American cheese to the highest standard attainable. To this manual, I especially invite the criticism of the cheese profession, in general, trusting that it may be a convenient book of reliable reference to the experienced and a work of utility to the novice. Geo E. Newell, Leonardsville, New York. The Factory Building and Site The site for a cheese factory should be a well-drained, slightly elevated location convenient to a copious and perpetual flow of water. The size of the building is, of course, to be measured by the amount of milk to be manufactured therein, but the same internal arrangement is needed alike in both small and large factories. The building should rest on a substantial stone foundation with a free circulation of air underneath, and a complete system of troughs be appendant to all carry, all slops, and way beyond contaminating distance. It is unnecessary 
that the building be more than a story and a half high, unless the upper apartment is required for something besides curing cheese. The make room should be sealed, and the curing room plastered. The make room should be in the front of the building, with the engine room on one side of it, and the milk delivery window on the other. The curing room should be in the back. Cut off all superfluous space about the building, and have just enough room to be nicely convenient. Put an awning roof over the delivery window, wide and long enough to cover wagon and team. Set the vats broadside to the milk scales, with ends towards the outer door. The platform for the weighing can and scales should be on a level with the top of the vats. A small office desk should be hung to the wall near the way can and close at hand so that every patron can see them. Have the aisle between the vats wide enough to permit of easy passage and at the farther ends of the vats sink a trough into the floor to carry off the way. Have similar troughs under the presses. The floor should be full enough in the centre to gravitate all slop toward the drains. It is useless to have a factory floor wet all of the time. Keep it dry by a system of neatness. The curing room should have an outside door from which cheese can be loaded, an adjoining lean-to shed for storing empty cheese boxes and housing fuel, is also a needed addition to the building. For a one-day milk delivery factory, no ice house is required. Build substantially and paint neatly, aiming to have a model-looking factory. About the year 1853, a gentleman residing near Rome, Oneida County, New York, Jesse Williams by name, conceived the idea of manufacturing his neighbor's milk in common with his own. This is the first known instance of manufacture in this country by associated dairies, although the method was previously in vogue in Switzerland. I quote from an old report, it required a long time to create the demand which now exists in England for American cheese, and to Herkimer County, New York, belongs the credit of creating it and securing the trade. It was mainly affected by bringing a high degree of skill to bear upon the manufacture generally, thus producing not only a good article, but uniformly good, or as near uniform as is possible, when made in different families. Cheese had been sent abroad in small amounts for many years, but when once by good quality and uniformity, it had secured a firm foothold, the amount exported increased with astonishing rapidity. By gradual growth, it had come to £9 million in 1859, and in 1860, it amounted to 23 millions, in 1861, to 40 millions, and the demand and supply have steadily increased ever since. It is a noteworthy fact that systematic attempts to improve the manufacture of cheese began to be made both in Somersetshire, England, and Herkimer County, New York about the same time, and also that with no knowledge on the part of either of the progress made by the other, after lengthened experiments, both should have adopted substantially the same method. 
for it is a fact that Cheddar and Herkimer methods so closely resemble each other that the only differences of any consequence are such as necessarily grow out to the difference of climate. Their process differs from most methods mainly in two particulars. First, in employing milk, which has attained a proximate degree of acidity, although never enough to be sensible to the taste, instead of such as is quite new, and second, in the separation of the whey from the curd, by causing its contraction and precipitation, instead of depending mainly on mechanical means, the improvements thus introduced within a comparatively recent period have resulted in several important advantages. First, a material reduction of labour. Second, the production of a larger amount and a better quality of cheese from a given quantity of milk. And lastly, The cheese made by this method requires less time for the ripening process, and thus is sooner ready for the market. A boiler of moderate capacity, with fittings complete, milk vats with steam pipes and connections, patent galvanized iron cheese hoops, a gang press, whey can with large gate, milk conductor to convey the lacteal fluid from the whey can to the cloth strainer over the vat, common sized scales that will weigh at least 600 pounds, a small sized scale for weighing cheese, two curd knives, one with horizontal and the other with perpendicular blades, large wheel with crank and endless rope for hoisting milk, two stone rennet jars of capacity of 10 gallons each, two thermometers, one for the make and the other for the curing room, jar for keeping and a twine, siphon and tin strainer for drawing whey from the vat, a self-salting curd mill, A curd mill is now indispensable to a factory, and a self-salting one is indispensable where only one man is employed. Rubber mop, curd broom and flour broom. Milk book for keeping accurate accounts of all business transacted in the establishment, including daily receipts of milk from patrons. A set of glass tubes in a case for testing milk as to the amount of cream in it, comparing its state of maturity, two water pails and one curd pail, a heavy curd scoop, two dippers, one of three and the other of six quarts capacity, glass graduated jar and lactometer for testing milk to locate water. Be sure and purchase a lactometer gauged for trying milk at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, many being gauged for 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and of little use in hot weather unless you have ice handy to chill the milk. Designed for the test, stencils, case and brush, for dating cheese and branding boxes, Tin funnel for conveying whey from the vat to the outside tank. Curd rake for agitating the product when cooking. A cheese trier. A curd sink is not now strictly essential, although some makers still prefer to use one. In glancing over the above list, we will mention some of the articles that can be supplemented by utensils of a more primitive and cheaper make. Such a retrograde change is not, however, desirable, 
Although sometimes in a small factory where the receipts to the manufacturer are limited, strict economy has to be practiced in order to leave a margin of profit. With economists of necessity, the boiler can be discarded and an old-fashioned underheater vat with a hot water tank attached, made to do service. I know of dozens of small factories throughout central New York who get along admirably with such apparatus. In the matter of press and hopes, you can do better without the gang press than you can without the pattern hoops. Remember that it has no economy to go back to the primitive hoop that makes necessary the hand bandaging of every cheese. If obliged to go without the gang press, get hoops that can be bandaged before the curd is put in them so that two cheese can be pressed under one screw in an old-fashioned press. In such a case, wooden followers would be required. One pair of scales can be got along with at a pinch, although two pairs would save a great deal of transferring and extra work. Do not get along with one curd knife, you need both the horizontal and the perpendicular. In order to cut the raw curd evenly and economically, a crane can take the place of a large wheel for hoisting milk if you consider it more convenient. Keep rennet in nothing but stone jars or vessels and keep at least 10 gallons always prepared ahead. Jugs are often used for Antoine, although an open jar admits of easy dipping and accurate measurement. Have your tinner make you a long narrow gill cup, to which should be soldered an upright six inch handle with a shepherd's crook in the end. Use the cup for measuring out the colouring, the long handle which can be hung by the crook on the inside of the jar. Preclude soiling the hands, clothing and floor with a scarlet dye. A curd mill of some sort is positively necessary in order to facilitate good. Even stock do not leave one out of the list of apparati under any consideration. I prefer a self-salting mill, not only on account of the ease with which curd can be ground, but also for its superior mechanism in thoroughly mixing the salt into the curd, as fast as it is torn by the teeth. In grinding curd with a common machine, the torn shreds quickly re-amalgamates into an almost solid mass that often requires harsh manipulation to separate. Then again, the salt being sprinkled by hand over the outer surface of the freshly torn curd sears and burns it before it can be worked into the mass. With a self-salter, the saline condiment is equally distributed through all parts at the proper limit of acid formation, thus preventing the curd from packing solidly and making the quality even and fine. If the milk you have in your vat is mature, or in other words, slightly tending towards sour, heat it as rapidly as possible when preparing for the application of rennet. In the cool extremes of the season, heat milk to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, and in warm weather to 85 degrees, before rennet is applied. If the milk is all right as to sweetness, as the bulk of milk is, heat it up to the desired point gradually, stirring it gently as frequent intervals with a long handled dipper. You stir for the purpose of keeping down the cream 
and evenly distributing the warmth that is permeating the lacteal mass. You stir it with great gentleness and care, because milk globules are eggs in miniature, and like their large relatives of biped production, they must be handled with care. If you wish to heat to 85 degrees and have an underheater vat or fire flue beneath the milk, withdraw the fire before it has quite reached that point. As the after warmth will carry it up a degree or two, be perfectly precise in all such little points, for on them hinge big results. With milk in normal condition as to maturity, standing at a temperature of 85 degrees in both ends of the vat, and with no cream visible on the surface, you are ready to take another step in the course of manufacture. If coloured cheese are desired, now apply Antoine sufficient to give a rich golden hue. Know exactly by experiment its strength as a dye. Always know the quantity of milk to a pound and portion out accurately. Work the colouring into the fluid with the same gentleness with which you have heretofore manipulated it while raising the temperature. When the milk is all of one even yellow tinge, attesting that the anoto is represented equally in every part, it is ready for the real inceptor of cheese, rennet. The tendency of modern cheese making is toward the quick coagulation of milk. The larger infusion of rennet necessary for this purpose begets cheese that can be quickly cured for a market where they are expected to soon be consumed. The old rule of coagulation in 20 minutes is now nearly obsolete although it will always hold good for cheese of long-keeping qualities. Fall-made cheese that are expected to be consumed during the winter months should be strengthened for age by coagulation in from 15 to 18 minutes. When we are dealing with the average spring and summer make, Trade demands more perishable stock, and we must cater to it. If you do not know the strength of your rennets, and you want the milk to thicken in eight or nine minutes, as it should do, previously test the lactic juice by putting a teaspoonful into a tumbler of milk kept warm at 85 degrees. If the glass of fluid thickens in five minutes, you need one quart of such rennet juice for every 800 pounds of milk to affect coagulation, as stated above. If the tested quantity thickens in less or longer time, a proportionate less or greater amount is required for your purpose. Measure the rennet extract with exactness so that there will be no miss in its proper adjustment to the milk, and then incorporate it into the vat of lacteal fluid. In infusing it into the milk structure, manipulate your dipper with the same caution that has characterized your former attitude toward the fragility constructed fluid under your hand. After stirring for five minutes, withdraw the dipper and let the surface of the milk come to a calm. Then pass the bottom of the empty dipper lightly over the vat to drive back any particles of cream that may be struggling to the surface. The milk will soon begin to roll up in the wake of the tin utensil in your hand in a rapidly thickening wave. Immediately withdraw the dipper, for the rennet has accomplished its mission. Turning to your vat cover, stretch it tightly over the fermenting milk. 
The cover mentioned should consist of a strip of canvas cloth or sheeting, running the entire length of the vat and lapping slightly over its width. The cloth should be tacked to lath or other light wooden strips. The width of the vat and the supports should be about two feet apart. When not in use, the cover can be rolled up like a section of carpeting and is not at all awkward to handle. Place the cover in a closed form on one end of the vat and unrolling it as fast as you walk. You can stretch it to the other end in half a minute, thus keeping your milk snug and close. I prefer to use such a cover every day during the season, and they are indispensable in spring and fall. Without some such device, the crust of the rapidly forming curd is chilled, retarding the action of the rennet, and the temperature of the whole mass is perceptibly lowered, which is not only undesirable, but positively detrimental to the natural and perfect formation of cheese. In the course of 20 or 30 minutes after coagulation, examine your crude cheese material and see if it is ready to cut up. Thrust the forefinger into the mass, and if the curd will split cleanly in front of it, it is ready for the knives. Milk should stand for about 45 minutes after the infusion of rennet before it is cut. But if the milk is very mature, in quality rennet will act on the casein more spontaneously. It may be firm enough to cut before that time, if, in such a case, the same amount of time the rennet had previously acted slowly on a proportionate quantity of milk, you can at once consider the quick action as a fair warning from nature that you must scald your curd in haste to keep ahead of the swiftly multiplying acid germs. As previously stated, as soon as the curd mass will cleave brittly over the finger, prepare your knives. First pick up the one with horizontal blade and hold it in a second in hot water. This will warm the steel so that it will not chill the curd. Cut the mass lengthwise, turning corners deftly without lifting the instrumental once until you are through. Then lay this knife aside for its work is done. Insert the perpendicular knife, also in hot water, and with it cut the curd first crosswise, then lengthwise then crosswise again, being sure to lap over the course of each cut. The curd is now in small cubes that are fast discharging whey from their several cellular system. They gravitate toward the bottom of the vat. If the curd has been cleft by the blades, gently and with great care, the rising whey has a clear greenish cast, attesting that it is freed from most of the albuminous substances of the milk and will render a good ratio to the patrons. If the milk was mature or too much rennet was incorporated with perfectly sweet milk, the whey will separate from the solids very rapidly. In either case, it wants an immediate application of heat after cutting. Curd from fairly good milk, with a proper infusion of rennet, should stand for a few moments after cutting before heat is turned on. Never apply heat under any circumstances until the raw curd has all disappeared beneath the whey surface. As soon as the heat has warmed the bottom of the vat, bear your arms and with the hands gently lift the new mass to the surface. In this lifting, give it a rolling motion, 
so that the cubes will all fall apart and exchange positions with one another. Two dangers now arise and you must be prepared to steer straight between them. First, as the heat comes surging up from beneath against the tin bottom of the vat, it makes it very hot below and cool on top. If the raw curd settles but a moment against the hot bottom, it is liable to be blistered and seared over to the subsequent detriment of the whole mass. Of course it needs a slow application of heat on the start and almost constant agitation. And here comes danger number two. If you do not stir your curd sufficiently in heating, the quality of your goods is at stake. And if you do not stir judiciously or stir too often and too harshly, your milk ratio is in jeopardy. By exercising good judgment, care and caution, you can avoid the two extremes and make each danger your willing servant. If your milk on the start is sweet and pure, Allow the heat to go up slowly until it touches the desired point. If on the other hand it is ripe, old and sour, push the heat with all vigour and scald as quickly as possible. With milk or right about three fourths of an hour's time should be consumed in bringing up the heat to scalding limit. But if otherwise, get in there in 15 minutes or half an hour, according to the exigency of the case. And that concludes tonight's reading. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this story about the making of cheese and how it was manufactured in the mid to late 1800s. Until next time.